Hello there. We're on the computer. Um, just gonna run through a diagram and explain all the different parts of this engine. Let's just get my face out of the way. All right. This is a rough diagram of how the engine is gonna work. I'm gonna go through each piece. I guess we'll just start with the global pieces. All right. First thing we're gonna have a look at is the logging system. In my design, I've only got two um, two logging levels. So there's information and there's warn. Uh, no, not warn. Information and error. So there's no warnings. Uh, if you're going to put a warning, you put an error and the program exits. My idea is that if anything, any undefined behavior happens at any point, the program will exit and you have to figure out what went wrong. Uh, from that point, instead of maybe you put a few warnings in for something that doesn't seem that severe, but then, you know, five minutes later, the whole thing crashes and you have to kind of go back through the logs and figure out exactly what went on. But the idea of these global uh, systems is that you can access them from anywhere within the client side, which is where you're making your game, or within the engine side. The next one I want to go through is events, and this is just going to be a probably an observer pattern or some kind of messaging system where you can have, uh, let's say, a bunch of ob objects basically saying, hey, I want to know when this event happens, let me know, and then this event happens, and then it just updates them. Like, hey, this thing happened, this thing happened. So that's pretty useful for coupling systems without using tight coupling. I'm going to go through the engine first and then we'll get to the client afterwards because I think it's important to understand what's happening here. So the default components that this is referring to is the entity system components, entity component system components, ECS components. And those are stuff like uh, position, position of an entity, those will probably be the default component like rotation. Um, maybe some kind of tag system or you know a group or layer or something like that there can be a few default components that we want to include with the engine and then all of the other components that you might want to use in a game can be created by the client and then they will be pushed into the initialization so we've got the editor here and it's actually going to be one of the last things that are built that is built and that's because it's a huge project in and of itself and it's not really necessary for anything else to work. You can actually make a whole game using just everything here except for the editor. So there's uh, the scene deserialization and serialization which is basically uh, once you've made a scene in the editor or via a text editor program if you have that ability. So if we use like JSON for the language, you could define a whole scene using JSON and then you could run it through the serializer. Then that would be used to create a scene object which you could then set as the active scene in the game and then the renderer would render that scene. So that's basically what that's used for. Uh, the editor is going to use it so when you move stuff around and you save the scene or if it automatically saves, I'm not sure exactly yet, then um, that file will be updated and then when you run the game, you know, it'll read the file, serialize it, open the scene, and it will be as if, you know, everything you change in the editor will be changed in the scene. Um, I like to have that happen kind of in real time. So you change something in the editor and then you just hit some um, play button like F5 or whatever, and then it's just changed. Uh, but for the initial stages, it's that's not a high priority. And the next thing that we want to go through is input. So input is actually going to be tied to our renderer pretty closely because the only way we can determine which buttons are pressed in the initial version is to actually look at the glfw callback functions. Um, and they provide a, a few functions to tell like where your mouse cursor is whether you press the button, which button it was, and if it's held down or if it's released or 
if you just pressed it quickly, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's going to be pretty important, but we don't really need that in the beginning because we're not even going to have a renderer for quite a while. Anyway, so the scene is, as I said, it's where all of the objects are um, and you know what properties they have and stuff like that. The UI is just the 2D layer on top of the 3D scene, uh, essentially. So you can create UI objects uh, that are just going to be flat on the screen. That's, that's the scope of that for now. I'm not going to worry about having sort of 3D UI in the game, like health bars on top of enemies, all that kind of stuff. That can be handled separately. Sound uh, is going to be one of the first things that we look at after we get the window up and running and get some graphics on the screen. And then the animation system, this is going to be a huge, huge deal. So animations covers everything from making buttons change a color when you hover over them, um, moving things when you hover over them, like wiggling a little bit or whatever. So that's UI elements. But it also covers things like your player attack animations or walking animations or maybe the light lighting is changing over time or any of these things. Any kind of values that can change over time is going to be handled by the animation system. So that's going to be, as you can imagine, a pretty big part or a pretty big system uh, in and of itself. Okay, the last thing in the engine list is the renderer uh, and the window, which are coupled together. So in our case we're using GLFW. The renderer is going to be responsible for drawing everything on the screen. So every UI element, every character, uh, all the animations and all that kind of stuff. And also handling the input. So when you press a button, uh, when you release a button, when you move the mouse, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a very, very important part, but it also doesn't need to come until much later because there's a lot of work that we need to do before we can even begin to draw stuff on the screen and there's a lot of um, systems we can build and test without even drawing things on the screen so this will be done probably at the end um, well not at the end it'll be done before all of these things here except maybe for yeah it'll be done before all of these things because it's required for all of these things okay let's move over to the client now the client is your game. Like if you're using this engine and you want to make a game, you need to be able to add things to the engine um, to suit whatever it is that you're making. Now since this engine is specifically designed for the game ideas that I have, um, the flexibility might not be as great as something like Unity or Unreal or anything like that, but it does have some flexibility. And that comes from these custom components. So custom components are basically data containers where you can add any kind of arbitrary data that you want to any entity in the game. Anyway, so the ECS systems um, is basically where you run all of the gameplay code. So you can hook into the game's update loop or you can hook into the event system um, and you can write your own ECS systems that will run pieces of code um, on specific entities based on what kind of components they have. So we're going to get into all the nitty gritty of that when we actually make the ECS. Um, but for now, basically you need to know that's where the, the run, the gameplay code is. So instead of putting scripts onto individual entities and you know, prefabs and like copying those around or whatever, you actually just write a system that handles every single um, entity of that of a particular type with particular components that you want and that system will just do whatever it is that you need to do with those entities so let's say you have for instance a bunch of foliage in the world and you want it to sway in the wind or you can create a custom component um, or you can use one of the default components like the tag you could tag it as foliage and maybe you make a custom component and you say, you know, this, the, uh, the amount of uh, resistance that you want it to have from the wind or something like that. And then you write a system and the system says, 
for every entity which has the tag foliage um, and the custom component wind resistance, whatever, then you know, do something. So like move its vertices over time to simulate some kind of wind blowing on it. So that's that's how you would do that. Rather than making a tree entity kind of prefab and then attaching a script to it, you wouldn't do that at all. So with that being said, the current vision for this engine is that the client will also be written in C. We will not be using a scripting language at all. Uh, play around with the idea later of implementing something like Lua, where you can implement your custom components and ECS systems, event bindings, etc., etc., or maybe C Sharp or some other language, Go, who knows. Um, but for now, the idea is that it will all be written in C as well. The last thing we have here is event bindings. And this is kind of what I was talking about just a minute ago, where you can bind to particular events that exist um, within the engine. And that's going to be useful just for making sure things happen at the right time. So, you know, if you right click on a button, you want to make sure that in your game that does the thing that you want it to do. So you'd use this event binding system. Okay, I think that pretty much sums up the game engine kind of structure and how it's going to work. Okay, now I'm going to walk you guys through how to set up the development environment that you're going to need on Windows. If you already know how to set up uh, like Visual Studio and use C using the uh, Microsoft compiler, then by all means use that. And if you already know how to link, do linking and libraries and all that kind of stuff in Visual Studio, just use that. That's totally fine. I'm going to be showing how to set it up um, using the uh, MinGW on Windows, uh, which is basically just installing a bunch of GNU uh, tools. So it'll be very similar to how I'm doing it. A lot of things will be happening in the terminal. You know, maybe that's your thing, maybe that's not your thing, but that's what I'm going to be doing. So see you in a second over on Windows. Okay, hey, we're in uh, we're in Windows, and I've actually gone ahead and installed things, and I was going to run through the whole process again with you guys, but for some reason my internet in my virtual machine is now not working, so I'm just going to quickly jump out of here and show you how to get this stuff. So the website you want to go to is mingw.org, and if you scroll down on the left here. There's going to be an all time download link. Click this. It's going to take you to this website. And then this should automatically start downloading. I'm not going to download it on this computer. Let's say you've downloaded that. You've installed it. You should get this window here. And it will come up with something that looks like this, except these will be unchecked. So, what you want to do is right click Minji W32 Base Bin and do mark for installation and then right click msys base bin mark that for installation as well then come up to the left here click installation and then click apply changes and then confirm and it will automatically download all the things that you need okay once that's finished assuming that you put everything at the default location you're going to want to open my pc go into your c drive then go into mingw msys 1.0 okay so in this msys folder you're going to find this batch file msys and you can just send that to your desktop uh, if you are a desktop kind of person i've done that now there's going to be another folder in here called home and then whatever username you have on your computer this is kind of like a linux home directory but on your windows installation and i've just made a folder in here called ember because that's the name of the engine and in here I've put a couple of files that I typed out earlier uh, very simple I can just close this one let's have a look at that there's a main file here it's a very simple C file it's just going to print hello world and then do an infinite loop so that the window stays open and the reason I made this along with the make file here which we can open in notepad is just to make sure that these tools work uh, in Windows. So we want to open MSYS and this is going to be your terminal basically. 
Now we just want to, where are we going? We're seeding into, that's the wrong button. Into Ember. Uh, uh, and now if we just run make, you can see that compiled successfully. And if we click output, it works. So we can see that we can compile C using the same method that I'm going to be using through the series, but on Windows. You can use any Windows tools you want as well, of course. So you can download VS Code, you can open this with Visual Studio, you can do whatever you want. Um, and it should work the same. Now, just to double check that this is in fact working, why don't we just introduce a bug here? So we'll just delete, uh, delete this or something and then save it. All right, and then uh, we'll run make again. Yep, there we go. We got the errors printed out correctly. That's what we want. Cool, so that's really all you need to get started on Windows. And the process after this will be pretty much exactly the same as what I'm doing on Linux. So hopefully that'll make it a bit easier to follow along, unless you already know your way around all of this stuff on Windows anyway, then you can just use Visual Studio, as I said earlier. Cool. All right, hopefully this video was informative. And don't forget that next Wednesday we're going to have the dictionary video, or this Wednesday. And uh, then on next Sunday we're going to be diving into the first episode where we start coding in the Engine series. Bye.